concerned with through this lecture series is the relationship between creation and goodness and the good. And uh, I think probably most of us are some variety of traditional monotheists. You know, we would probably think that a good creator made, made the world, the creation um, comes from a good creator. So at some level, we have a commitment to thinking that creation must be good, but that doesn't mean it's clear to us how this works out, what the nature of the relationship is, or uh, let alone that it feels real to us experientially. What I'd like to do today is talk through some of the philosophical barriers to understanding how goodness relates to broader creation. And then from on the basis of those metaphysical observations, these philosophical observations, I'll draw some conclusions about um, what this means for how we can better know and recognize the goodness of creation. And then finally, some, some more uh, adventurous uh, comments on what this might mean for, for empirical science toward the end. But to start with, thinking about the unity of creation and the good, uh, some of the barriers here are, are barriers even to thinking that the good is real at all, let alone how it might be united to broader creation. There's a phenomenon that um, some philosophers discuss called derealization, which is this phenomenon that seems to have begun uh, just in the last 200 years or so, uh, as human society, at least in the West, became more urban, more and more people lived in man-made environments away from nature. Uh, eventually, of course, the, the internet was invented and more and more we lived not only in man-made urban environments, but we basically lived in digital environments and probably never more so than the last 10 months. And then of course, we can now take the digital environment that we live in with us anywhere we go with our smartphones. So there's this been this cultural process um, of moving away from nature just because of the, the shape that uh, the economy and the way of, life, way of life has taken us. And this has, for some people, created a sense that reality itself is culturally contingent, like much of the built environment that we interact with is. Um, everything, more and more of what we see has been made by humans, it's changeable, it's transient, and it, it gives rise to this visceral sense that maybe everything is like that. It's hard to accept uh, some kind of absolute goodness of, of creation or anything else if that's the pervading sensibility. Maybe even more significant, um, in the last several centuries, we might call it a, uh, an orientation of instrumentalization. Um, we more and more have been able to use technology to bring aspects of creation under our control and to do things uh, with, with the raw material of creation. A lot of this, of course, has been very good. Standard of living has, has skyrocketed, over, skyrocketed over the last few centuries, but uh, it seems to have gone hand in hand with this basic orientation um, at a phenomenological level that creation exists for us to use. Uh, it's sort of a utilitarian instrumentalizing relationship to, to the world. This also makes it difficult to recognize an independent good, a good beyond whatever ends we might happen to have for creation. However, I'm not going to talk uh, in great depth about either of these barriers. I wanted to flag them because I think they're going to, they're true for all of us to some degree. Um, I hopefully, because, you know, as some kind of monotheist, as Christians or as, as Jews or as Muslims, we, we know we, we need to push back to some degree against uh, these impulses, these orientations. Um, but as a philosopher, I'm going to focus more on several philosophical arguments that became prevalent within uh, academic thought, trying to understand, of trying to understand reality, and helped, uh, often I think served to help encourage derealization and instrumentalist orientation to the world because it, it goes beyond just a feeling and, and, and then begins to look like, oh, we have principled rational basis for thinking the good doesn't exist or isn't connected to a creational order. The first of these is what's known as the fact value gap. 
And one way to, to get into the, the issue of the fact and value gap is to, to give an example of someone who's relying on it to help sort of flesh out what this looks like in, in real life. So let's go back to 1917. Some university students in, in Munich asked Max Weber, who was, was one of the founders of sociology, to give them a lecture on the vocation of uh, scientific academic life. And they're very optimistic about the role of science. Um, the Enlightenment narrative was uh, you know, very, very uh, powerful at the time. And there, were, there was lots of um, expectation that we, we could do a lot through a scientific career. Weber uh, famously sort of a morose individual. He struggled with depression through much of his life. We, I think we would now recognize as depression. So he gets up to give this talk to these, these excited students and um, he, he uh, sort of lets them down in terms of what they were hoping. And what he had to say, I actually can't read this because of the, the screen setup, so I'll go to my notes. Among other things, in the course of his lectures, Weber said, who aside from the overgrown children still to be found among our scientists actually believes that knowing astronomy or biology or physics or chemistry will tell us anything about the meaning of the world? What meaning can the scholar's work have? Tolstoy has provided the simplest answer when he wrote, science is meaningless because it provides no answer to the only question that matters. What should we do? How should we live? Weber goes on to say, uh, think about medicine. It can tell you how to prolong life. It can't tell you why we think that's good. It can't tell you that we should do this. He goes on, every natural science answers the question, what should we do if we want to use the techniques at our disposal, disposal to control life? while leaving unanswered, even unasked, simply taken for granted whether we should control life through technology, whether we want to, and whether it is ultimately meaningful to do so. So he is effectively criticizing the student's expectation that um, science could show, take us to a better life through what it discovers about the world, because he says that's not the sort of thing that science can do. Science can tell you certain things about the world, empirical facts, cannot tell you about the realm of the ethical, what's good, what we ought to do, or what's evil. This is because he accepted a version of the fact value gap. So there are two versions of the fact value gap, at least two main versions. Uh, we'll begin with, with what I would call the bad fact value gap. It's, uh, the view is basically what's represented here on the slide. So you have the facts on one side and you have the values on the other side. And look at that huge gap in between them. On this view of the fact value gap, uh, there are the things you can know about the world that are true. And then there are the beliefs you can have about what is good and bad and so forth. And those do not overlap. Now, why do I say it's bad? It may already, already be evident, uh, but the, the trouble is that facts are just true claims about the world. And so if the claim is that values aren't among those things, then this version of the fact value gap is saying that there aren't true claims about what's good or what we ought to do or anything within the, the ethical realm. So uh, if you're not a moral nihilist, then you have a good reason to think this version of the, of the fact value gap is wrong. And you know, even if you aren't sort of presupposed to accept the reality of goodness, um, there are pretty good arguments uh, for this view. I mean, most of us I think would say, well, you." it's good to love your children, or at the very least that it's, it's bad to torture people for fun. So most people can identify, yeah, I think, I think this is a true moral claim. Um, moral nihilism can't be correct. And so for all of us, this version of the fact value gap um, isn't, a live, isn't a live option. I think it's, it's accepted um, too often merely because this kind of secret presupposition of, of this distinction isn't noticed. I think sometimes um, it's hard to recognize that, that this version of the fact value gap is really saying, um, well, there's a gap between them because there really aren't any facts about, about values or about ethics. But there's a better version. The better version uh, doesn't, doesn't say there's really a gap. It's more of just a principle distinction. But the distinction is among things that are true. And so it would put the, the facts about the values about ethics within the realm of the facts. So uh, 
we might say, you know, it's 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 good to love your children. It's bad to torture people people for fun. These are facts, and they're they're just as true as empirical facts about the world. Here's another way to sort of graphically represent what's happening with the good version of the fact value gap. When you add together the value facts and the non-value facts, that gives you all of the facts. So what is the good version of the fact value gap saying about the nature of the ethical realm, about the, about the good? Well, it's saying that uh, you basically can't build up to get ethical facts from other kinds of facts that aren't about ethics. The, this version of the fact value gap is sometimes described as um, the is-ought problem, or as no ought from is. And we can, we can sort of model this structure by thinking about the colors, as is familiar to most of us, you, you can mix certain colors to get other colors. You can, you can mix or combine red and blue, and that gives you purple. Um, but there are some things that, some colors that you cannot get unless you already start with them. So red, for instance, there are no other colors you can mix together to get red. There's some weird things that happen with light. That's not really a case of color mixing. It's more about the, the causal basis for the causes these colors in us, but the, the, the color itself, the quality of red, there's no way to get that except by starting with red itself. It's, it's a fundamental building block of the colors. There are other examples we could point to that help us understand the, the relationship between the ethical realm and, and the rest of reality uh, in terms of what you can build from other things. I mean, you might also recognize that um, there are some things in our experience that simply can't be built out of certain, certain other things. You can't build a cell phone out of cotton balls. The cotton balls just don't have the right kinds of features and properties that no matter how you recombine them are going to give you a functional cell phone. And this is how it is with the ethical realm. So, you know, if, if we recognize that for the colors, the primary colors, take red for instance, no red from non-red, something similar holds for the good, no good from non-good. If you want to, to understand the ethical world, you have to start with ethical concepts. There's no other path. So they are among the fundamental building blocks of reality, as, as we might call them in metaphysics. They're not the only ones. Um, you know, you have to have things that are basic, sort of the basic palette of colors or the basic blocks to build everything else. And, you know, identity is in there and possibility, necessity, and probably consciousness, but the ethical is also there. So the fact value gap, at least as often discussed, um, the, what I'm calling the bad version, is a myth. There's a good version. It's really more about making a principal distinction between the facts that are about the ethical realm and the facts that are about everything else. Uh, but there's, you know, you might wonder, well, how, how did it come about that people thought there was this gap in the first place? What, what might have persuaded Weber? Um, what, what accounts for the staying power or the intuitive plausibility of there being some kind of um, deeper gap, deeper division, disunity between uh, the empirical side of reality and, and the good. This is one of the questions that this, this we, have to, we have to discuss if we're going to get a better feel for what, what might unify the creational order and the ethical order. Another promising um, place to look here to, to answer some of these questions uh, is by looking at a distinction that was that rose to prominence around the beginning of the early modern period in, in philosophy about 500 years ago. And this is known as the primary secondary quality distinction. The basic idea is, is this. So I'll illustrate it with a, a little story. A very dear friend of mine, unfortunately got coronavirus a few months ago. And as a result, he lost his sense of taste. He would bake chocolate chip cookies, get a cookie fresh from the oven, still warm, take a bite, and it just tasted like ashes. He couldn't taste it at all. The primary secondary quality distinction says uh, the aspects of things that you can discern through your senses or from ordinary experience, these uh, it calls secondary quality. So taste, the feeling of warmth, um, texture, these they are considered secondary. What are the primary qualities? What are the, what are the, the the aspects of a, of a thing, of an object, 
that will be considered primary. Well, they're, they're the things that don't change with, with, uh, with the observer. They're things that, are, that remain the same no matter what sort of relationship the object is put into. So in the case of the cookie, it would be things like its size, its shape, its mass, the chemical construction of, the, of its ingredients. Um, these uh, were seen as primary. These were taken to be sort of like, like the red and the secondary qualities were taken to be like the mixed colors, the greens and the purples. Toward fleshing out uh, sort of the background argument for this distinction, I'll read a little passage from Galileo, who's, who was among the, the early modern thinkers who was um, arguing for this kind of distinction. Here's how he was thinking of it. But that external bodies to excite in us these tastes, these odors and these sounds demanded other than size, figure, number and slow or rapid motion, I do not believe. And I judge that if the ears, the tongue and the nostrils were taken away, the figure, the numbers and the motion would indeed remain, but not the odors, nor the tastes, nor the sounds, which without the living animal, I do not believe are anything more than names. Just as tickling is precisely nothing but a name if the armpit and the nasal membranes be removed. He, earlier he was talking about tickling his nose with a small feather. Many affections which are reputed to be qualities residing in the external object have truly no other existence than in us and without us are nothing else than names. So in an effort to get to what's really objectively present about the world and not be deceived by our senses um, and eventually to emphasize the, those aspects of the world that we can control, the distinction was drawn in this way. You have the primary stuff, they tend to always be quantitative, mathematical, spatial features of things. Everything else is secondary and is seen as derivative or as Galileo was hinting, not genuine, just sort of our subjective impression that we're re projecting onto the object. However, as we've already seen, um, we have reason to resist this way of drawing the distinction. If it really is the case that uh, the ethical is a fundamental aspect of reality, you, you can't get the ethical by building up from anything else, then it's going to have to be actually one of these primary features. It can't be secondary because it's something that is existing objectively as objectively present. You can't build up to it from other, other aspects. We have reason to think that goodness really does exist. So, it would seem that the ethical is among the primary, the primary qualities. Well, what does this tell us about the relationship between the good and creation? Well, think about one of the, the implications of the primary quali secondary quality distinction as, as the early moderns in Galileo, Galileo drew it and is still pretty popular uh, today within philosophy. Um, it's not just that sensory qualities were being considered secondary or considered secondary qualities. Uh, anything that it isn't quantitative, anything that isn't sort of demonstrably there and present in spatial, um, in a spatial or mechanical way in the object is secondary or not genuine. And this would include the ethical features of things. We of course have reason to think that the ethical really is present, so we can't accept this picture. Um, but it's, it's uh, very important to notice what happens to our conception of the world if we let the ethical back in, if we recognize that it is primary. What we see, I believe, is that the, the primary secondary quality distinction as it's been drawn has gotten things upside down. Here's the version that's prevalent today and was, put, was popularized by, by Galileo and Locke and and Kepler and some others. So you have the secondary qualities, these would include the taste, um, sensory qualities of things, but also more importantly, value, agency, things of this nature. They depend on the primary qualities, shape, motion, the quantitative features. So you see there's a, this sort of hier hierarchical structure. What's really important, what's really fundamental are shape and motion and not so much value, agency, consciousness, uh, let alone the sensory qualities of things. But once, but once we recognize that the ethical is genuine, we have the basis to make a different kind of argument. Because it's not just that 
the ethical is a part of reality along with shape and motion, we have reasons to think that it is, it is prior to shape and motion. It's, it goes deeper into what things are than, than the objective quanti quantifiable properties of things. Now, why is that? Let me give you an example to help illustrate um, why I think we need to accept this sort of inversion of, the, of how we've been thinking about the hierarchy in reality. When I was a, a kid, I enjoyed playing this old Nintendo. It wasn't old at the time, but the Nintendo video game, The Legend of Zelda. I'm sure many of you remember it. Um, you're this, you navigate this small elfin character through castles and caves, collecting weapons and treasure, and the, the ultimate objective is to rescue the princess Zelda. Now imagine trying to understand this game only by looking at the mechanical parts of the cartridge and game console. If you were a skilled electrical engineer, uh, you may be able to get close. But um, even, even in that ideal scenario, you, you can recognize the reason these mechanical parts are the way that they are is for the sake of providing a certain kind of experiential gameplay. The characters are supposed to look a certain way. You're supposed to be able to exercise your agency in, in navigating the character through this world. Um, it's for the, the music, which, which sets the, the atmosphere of the game. It's for the sake of all of these aspects that the underlying mechanical qualities are the way that they are. And once we, and once we recognize that the ethical is, is real, we can take the further step and recognize, well, what is the, the telos? What is the reason? What is the purpose for which God made the things that exist? As, especially in our case, as concerns living organisms, you know, elements of creation. It's for the good that they can they contribute. The smaller parts of the thing are the way they are in order to give rise to the, the ordinary functioning of the organism. And uh, the ultimate objective of any organism is, it is the good for which it was made. Um, we can recognize instances, instances of deformity in, in creatures. And what we're recognizing in those cases is something is inhibiting it from thriving. Something is preventing it from achieving the way of life that it was created to have. Uh, and so this, this teleological orientation toward the way it was supposed to be, toward, toward this good, this helps explain the way everything else about it has been designed right down to the very small, the small parts of it. One more example, because I think a lot of this is pretty abstract, but it helps me to think about things in this way. My wife has a Lego kit that, um, when, when assembled, makes a small model of um, falling water, the famous architectural uh, house, Frank Lloyd Wright. And uh, the question we could ask ourselves is, well, over here on one side, we see all the parts that when assembled will make the model of the house. We have also have an instruction booklet that shows us how to build them. And then finally, we have the house itself once assembled. Which came first? What is prior? What, you know, you might say at first blush, well, it's the, it's the pieces because you start with the pieces and then you put them together and it makes the house. But that can't be right because why did the pieces when assembled perfectly add up to making a small model of falling water. It must be that there was something prior to the pieces that um, for the sake of which the pieces were designed the way that they were. It's not even the instructions because the instructions themselves um, were designed for the purpose of showing us how to assemble the basic components together to get the house. What really came first, maybe this is unfair, it's not on here. It's it's. It's this teleological objective. It's this idea of what the thing should be. And once the pieces are assembled, then um, the object comes close at least, if not fully realizing this objective, the purpose for which it was made, which has guided the design and the nature of the pieces that when assembled give you, give you the, the model of the house. So uh, let's say a bit about the overall, what you might call the cosmological structure of, of value, of the good. 
what I think we can see from observations um, about organisms, that namely that their underlying physical physical structure is there for the sake of the good of the organism. You know, for this, you know, the cat, uh, the good of the cat involves its being able to creep and to stalk, and it can only do that if its if its body is is constructed in a certain way. And so you can kind of see by thinking about what it would take to reverse engineer it, that the small parts are not fundamental. They're there for the sake of the, the whole organism. And this, this sort of, this structure seems to be uh, represented in all, in all creatures. So the very small is for the sake of the organism. Um, how do the organisms themselves relate to other organisms? It seems uh, reasonable to suppose especially given the, the assumption of a, of a good creator, that ultimately the, the objectives, the purposes for which organisms were made, they need to dovetail. They need to unite in some kind of coherent whole. Otherwise, if, if the fulfill, fulfillment of the objectives of the various organisms necessarily come into conflict, um, that seems, that seems uh, it's difficult to account for that on the assumption of, of a good creator. So at least a plausible conception from which to proceed is that ultimately the purposes for which organisms were made uh, have to dovetail and, and unite in this coherent whole. So the very small we, we then see is there for the sake of what, we, what you might call the middle-sized objects, the organisms, what Aristotle would have called the substances, um, trees, animals, human beings. And these in turn, their goods ultimately, ideally need to unite into an overall uh, an overall good that incorporates um, everything in the cosmos. That's the overall structure. At least I think a, it's a better overall picture of reality than that provided by um, sort of the early modern conception, which is still prevalent in some, in some places. I, I now want to turn a little bit from metaphysics. Um, st we'll still draw on metaphysics, but let's look at some epistemological consequences, some things that, that we, uh, ought to be able to recognize we can know about the good as represented in creation if we have this sort of guiding metaphysical, metaphysical conception that I've been trying to, to describe. So first of all, um, I think we would call this the, the priority of the whole organism. If you read a paper from um, any of the biological sciences or if you get a textbook in biology, most of it will concern itself with the very small, or if it's focusing on ecology, sort of the larger environmental system that an organism fits into. And this makes perfectly good sense. Uh, this, this sort of uh, inquiry should be done. We, we should desire to know how everything works insofar as it's possible. The difficulty is that, as we've seen, empirical science can't tell us about the good. This was the, the problem if it is a problem, that, that even the good version of the fact value gap uh, tells us about. So what does this mean for our knowledge of the good of organisms, of, the, of one of the main aspects of creation, the living creatures we come into contact with? It tells us that the sciences are, on this point, not going to be very helpful. Uh, fortunately, the goods that are present in organisms do appear to be at the, le at the level of the organism. They're not, they're not found as vividly at the level of the very small for the reasons that we've seen. The very small is the way that it is to build up to the kinds of qualities and, and behaviors and um, aspects of the organism that enable it to live the kind of life that's appropriate to it. One upshot of, of this is that ordinary observation and experience of animals actually has a shot at telling us something important about the, the unique and peculiar good that they contribute to the world. Science is of course crucial, but we should never fall into the trap of thinking that, well, what can I really know about the good of creation? Uh, I'm not a biologist, so um, I, best not to think about it. On the contrary, uh, biology can't tell you about the good if it's, if it's, if it's really as empirical as, as, a, as it would like to be, so you don't really have any option other than using the good detecting equipment that you provided um, by your creator, the only sort of good detector that, 
human beings seem to have access to. So we see that uh, the, there's an evident goodness in creatures at the level of the whole organism, not um, that's for the sake of which the small, the very small parts of a creature are the way that it are, that it are the way that they are. But what about uh, its ecological role? You know, you might say, look, the sciences do tell us a great deal about why creatures are the way that they are, why they have the patterns that they have, the why their appendages are shaped the way that they are, why they have the teeth that they have, um, and this is understood in terms of the role it plays in an, in, a, in an ecological structure. Every creature has to be able to survive, reproduce. And this guides its nature. This shapes the way that it, um, this explains the way that it is. Certainly, every creature must survive and reproduce and these ecological environmental factors um, are paramount for explaining the, why the creature is the way that it is. But there's an, there are interesting thought experiments we can do that tell us this isn't a fully satisfying explanation. Um, when you try to think about the good features that creatures have that we're able to discern at the level of, of the whole organism, um, just survival and reproduction appears insufficient. Let me, let me give a few examples. Many, many organisms are brightly colored, apparently uh, for the purpose of warning predators that they're they're venomous or toxic. So coral snakes, vividly colored, um, beautiful, beautiful to look at, deadly to, 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 to handle. Uh, somehow other creatures in their environment uh, are able to interpret these vivid colors and to stay away. And so a common explanation would be, well, they have these bright colors because of the survival advantage that it gives them to prevent creatures from, from uh, eating them. And it also serves the other creatures by giving them a warning not to mess with a venomous coral snake or a toxic poison dart frog from the Amazon. Even so, this does not provide a, a, a full explanation for why they have the features that they have, because there are any number of ways that the organisms could have, could have been developed that would per, per, permit them to warn or to, to give up, pass information to other creatures in their environment, to take in information from their environment, so that they can survive and reproduce. Um, to go to the extremes, it could be that everything, everything in reality is sort of a monochrome gray. And uh, each creature has a sort of a binary reader and can read ones and zeros off of other creatures. And this enables them to know which ones to avoid, which ones to eat, uh, where, to, where to go for shelter, how to find a mate. We might think about it this way. So all this biologically necessary are that organisms have a way to survive and reproduce. You know, maybe a fish is this particular series of ones and zeros. Maybe, maybe a bird is that one. Maybe, you know, here's a landscape. There's a tree and a girl and a sun. If we're just looking at what is required to account for their, the features of the organism in terms of sort of a, a systemic biological explanation as given by the empirical sciences, this is all that's necessary. But what do we actually see? We actually see that organisms are more like with trees and the sunshine. This far outstrips what is necessary for necessary for biological life. And uh, as people who recognize that that the ultimate origin of creation is a good creator, uh, I think it's clear what the the real explanation is, at least in part. It it can't be accidental that in a bewildering number of cases, the things we encounter in God's creation are beautiful and good in ways that go beyond what's required for, the, for biological survival. Um, the world could have been ever so many other ways and been, have been duller and more boring and things still would have been able to survive and, and reproduce, yet that's not what we see. And a lot of the examples that I've given, I focused on non-human animals, fish, kestrels, coral snakes, those sorts of things. That's mostly because it's more efficient to talk about those kinds of organisms. When you get into human beings, it's more complicated, but the kinds of observations that I've been making, if they hold for the, for the non-human animals, they certainly hold for human beings. 
the good that we're able to perceive in our loved ones, in our friends, and those we come into contact with. Uh, in these cases too, they, they sur they've far surpassed what is, what is necessary for biological survival. The good of friendship is, goes far beyond what might be necessary for having someone to, to protect you in case of danger or to provide shelter to you in case of da um, danger as well for, for, the, needs, for the needs of reproduction. Um, the goods of human beings are not evident at the level of, of ordinary biological, empirical biological study, but they are evident to human beings as knowers, as experiencers, experiencers of the world that, into which we've, we've been placed. So what are the implications for, for inquiry? Many of us here are in the academy. We try to know things. We, we read books um, from different, different kinds of disciplines. We want to create a, a picture of the world that makes sense to us and to other people. Um, how, what, how should we change things, given these observations? Is a biological science that's restricted to the purely empirical, um, can it be complete? I don't think so. Uh, we, we need to be able to unify our understanding of the good of creatures with their empirically observable biological features. The, um, part, of the, part of the argument here is recognizing um, that given the metaphysical view of creation that I've, that I've been trying to describe, namely that things have a telos, they have a final end or final cause as Aristotle would have put it, a purpose for, for which it's made uh, that is good. Um, and given that understanding what, what an organism is, what a thing is, will require you to understand what its good purpose is, then we can't even understand the, the nature of the identity of organisms in the world unless we have this understanding of the good. So a biological science, the biological sciences as they currently stand, they cannot tell us the identity of things. They can uh, oftentimes tell us enough to pick out different kinds of things from other kinds of things. They can tell you about the inner workings of those, of those individuals. They can tell you about the role they play um, with respect to survival in a broader ecosystem. But um, because the good is not empirical, they cannot tell us about the, the purpose or the telos of these organisms. And therefore they cannot even tell us what the essence or the identity of the organisms are. So an adequate science in the, in the traditional sense of, of you know, a, a complete body of knowledge about some area is going to have to incorporate knowledge of the good. Now, of, you're probably thinking that doesn't seem likely. Paul, even if your arguments are correct, um, even if other people read your paper or see this, this, this uh, presentation, it's unlikely that, that the sciences are going to, to change in any way what they're doing. That, that, I think that's probably correct. Uh, but, I think it's important to realize the limitations that that the sciences, as they currently, um, as they're currently incarnated, have, and to realize that something is being left out um, if we're if we're doing pu a purely empirical investigation of the world, and then to make the right sorts of adjustments in how we think about reality. It's no longer adequate to say, uh, "Well, I don't really know what things are like because I'm not a." I'm not, I'm not a biologist. I don't really know about the natural world because I, I don't have access to a lab. There are some things you won't be able to know that I won't be able to know, but because only human beings can detect the good, uh, there actually is a great deal that, that you and I are able to know about, about creation. Another objection would be, Paul, even if you tried to begin to develop uh, a biological science, for instance, that, that included um, considerations of the good objectives or purposes of, of organisms, how would that change the usefulness of the science? Uh, right now, the sciences are, are very useful for, um, we've been talking about biology, so biological technologies, um, stopping, you know, finding a vaccine, for instance, that can, that can help provide uh, herd immunity against the coronavirus. So you know, there's all kinds of um, very useful consequences for science as it stands. What, what, what are we going to gain? From, from trying to incorporate knowledge of the good. I grant that it will, it's unlikely to add very much in the way of the kinds of uh, utility that the current sciences provide us. It's unclear to me that it would be any sort of advance, 
on that front. The advantage, the benefit that I think um, increased consideration of the good of organisms may have though comes from another quarter. If it's true that, that our creator designed organisms in the way that they are and that he created them in their very essence and their identity to have the good, the good objectives that they have uh, as organisms to contribute the peculiar goods that they do to reality, then these are things that he cared about. And so insofar as our interests diverge from God's interests, we should, wor we should worry about that. It's true that God also created a world that, with capacities for us to, to use um, various, various features of the world, various uh, substances of the world for our ends. But, uh, it, it, doesn't, but it doesn't stop there. We, we, it's important that we remain mindful of the unique goods that are present in each of these things. Ultimately, uh, it seems to me, creation is a gift uh, that we've been called to steward. And we've done very well in many respects in understanding the world and how to, and how to utilize it. Um, it seems to me we've done less well with appreciating it as a gift and spending, spending uh, many resources in understanding the unique goods of, the, of creation as God has designed it. So hopefully this provides at least one way of thinking about the unity of creation and the good, the good that is the, the teleological destination, the purpose for which each organism was created, um, the ultimate uh, holistic combination of those ends, things coming together, uh, at least at the restoration of all things, if, if not in our lifetimes, and the benefit that we can experience from, from recognizing and accepting and, and enjoying the experience of these, these goods in creation. Thank you. Paul, thank you very much for a stimulating and helpful paper. Um, we're gonna move now to a time of engagement with uh, Paul's uh, argument. Uh, let me just uh, remind the audience that at the bottom of your Zoom box, you'll see an op a place where you can um, engage in some of the Q&A. So feel free to uh, put some of your questions that you might have in there. But let me start, first of all, with uh, our panelists and ask if there's a panelist that would like to uh, ask Paul a question or get the conversation going. Dr. O'Donovan. Thank you. It's the virtue of a really interesting lecture that it raises lots of questions. And uh, this one certainly did for me, and I think it's a measure of its, um, the seriousness and uh, thoroughness with which it's tackled um, the exploration of being in the good. I really appreciated the whole line on which, um, Paul, you are developing your thought here. I do have a cluster of questions. I shall just try to focus on the central one, I think. Um, around the way you organize the unitary, the unity of the good around a part whole concept. Now, the model for scientific knowledge and empirical knowledge in your mind is biology, um, in this lecture at any rate. And biology uh, reckons it knows about something called organisms. It examines organisms. It has therefore quite a, a, a good, clear way of distinguishing um, types of good, uh, contributory goods, the goods of parts of organisms, of hands, of feet, of heart, of lungs and liver and so on, and the good of the organism as a whole. And this uh, you're offering to us, as I understand it, as a kind of model for the um, unitary character of the good of the cosmos as a whole, if I've understood your argument um, correctly. Now, um, this worries me on two scores, I think. Um, one is whether this uh, particular privileging of biology doesn't precisely privilege ourselves and our prejudices, and how one might apply the same thing, say, to astrophysics. Um, and can we still say, for example, that 
the good of the galaxy is greater than the good of any of the planetary systems that belong to the galaxy. This all assuming they're uninhabited, just <clears throat> on the part of the whole principle alone. Does that make any sense? Um, and does it distinguish what intuitively I think we feel that there are different kinds of goods which are difficult to compare and perhaps both of which need to be combined in a life but of which one is good in a rather sharper way than another. There are moral goods and there are goods of enjoyment and consumption. Does it elaborate that difference in any sort of way? So I'm, I'm just wondering what help the part whole model is in your thinking actually to elucidating an order of the goods and, uh, and, and an overall unity of the goods in the, in the creation. No, thank you, Oliver. I, so um, I was relying on the part whole structure here primarily um, as a way of, in a sense, beginning with, with prevalent ways of, of structuring reality. You know, so so the model of um, both at least analytic philosophy and the sciences uh, in modernity has, I think, largely been um, want to understand reality in, in the part whole way. You know, we keep pushing down, looking for um, what's happening at the fundamental level. The people who are tasked with providing the a grand unified theory of reality are the physicists who study the smallest things. Um, I was talking about bi biology only because no one has any idea how the, the smallest parts of physics really add up to give us the qualities of, of organisms. Plenty of philosophers and scientists think that, it, it well, it must. It must do so. We don't know how, but we know that it has to. There has to be this hierarchical structure. Uh, so when I started talking about the, the, the habits, the, the qualities of organisms, I, biology seemed to be the place from which to begin because there's really nothing very helpful that I think anyone can say in terms of physics. Uh, and so there, my, my goal was to say, we've, we have been uh, led to believe that those fields of knowledge that focus on creatures um, have told us what needs to be known about them uh, in particular biology, and much of this concerns either the, the small parts of an organism, sort of cellular biology, uh, molecular biology, or it concerns the role in a, in a larger system. And my, my, what I was trying to do, what I hope to do is say, actually, we can understand enough about the good of, an, of a given organism to see that this is discerned at the level of the whole organism. And there's a, an intelligible structure that relates the operations of its smaller parts to the organism. And the good of the organism itself uh, ties together with the goods of other organisms. So it, from either way, from looking at this overall system, from looking at the small parts, you're pushed toward, back toward the organism itself. So I don't know if, if this gets at, at one of your questions, um, but that's how I was thinking of it. Your question about astrophysics, I simply don't know. I, I'm not sure that what I've been saying about organisms could be said for a planet or for a star. Uh, I haven't thought about it, but I'm not sure that I, I'm not sure this is a, a harmful disanalogy. Uh, I just haven't thought about those aspects. If you have observations, I, I would welcome them. Chris, well, yeah, I, just coming in at that last point um, and think, sort of trying to think biblically around it as well. I mean, it's interesting that the, the Psalms like Psalm 104, 148, 150 bind and others, of course, bind together biology and astrophysics uh, and biology, not only at the organism, at the level of animate organisms, you know, uh, creatures, but also uh, the non-human and the inanimate, you know, rocks and mountains and minerals as well. And they all have a good in because they have a good purpose uh, serving not just humans, but in, you know, Job's, uh, the great chapters in Job of creation 38, you know, uh, what things do for other 
things, uh, you know, what they contribute to the whole seems a, an important part. And I'm just wondering whether a, 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 an astrophysicist or a scientist might say that, um, well, this universe at the, at the level of astrophysics, it's the anthropic principle in a sense, isn't it, is the way it is because we are here. If, if the universe weren't as it is, then this planet wouldn't be here as it is. And so the very fact that we have a planet with biological life on it um, is in a sense dependent upon there being a universe in which these stars and, and galaxies is, is, exist. So their good is in some sense contingent upon the reality of planet Earth in the priority and the teleology of the creator of the whole thing. Mm. Uh, that would seem to me to be a connected argument It would somehow connect physics and biology and of course chemistry in the middle as well. Would it? I'm not sure, but it seems to me that it might. I think so. I mean, what, one difficulty is that, uh, the, you know, you were talking about the anthropic principle. Um, it is true that, that you know, how, however God made the, uh, the starry hosts, um, the, the elements in, in outer space, they can't prevent the, the life, they can't prevent life on earth. I don't have a good answer um, or a good argument for thinking that the good of these, you know, the, you know, there are stars that are just incredibly far away from us that we can't see even with our best instruments. Um, I, I, from my way of thinking, it's harder to make a case that the good of these entities um, is as discernibly connected uh, with our own in the way that the other organisms we, we live amongst on Earth are. But I, part of this may be an artifact of my not having thought about that, that issue. Um, I guess I'm, this is, this is just sort of an intuition sharing at this point, but, but it seems that um, the goods of organisms on Earth um, must more tightly relate uh, to each other than they, than they must with, with entities that are so far away, it's unclear whether there's any, there is or could be any causal interaction. That, may, that raises the question, what's the point of those stars that are so far away that we can't see them? I don't know. Uh, maybe we're not the only, the only sentient beings, I'm not sure, but I, I, don't, I don't have an answer. But you are committed, I think, to thinking that there is an answer to that question. That is, as I understand you, you have ruled out the possibility of there being many final goods. That there must be, a, right? in, in the end, they must cohere? Or sort of, must, um, you say they must cohere. And I've got you right, have I? Yes, yeah, so they must cohere. Um, but perhaps every part doesn't need to uh, intelligibly relate to every other part. I don't know. This is a good question, Oliver. I, have, I haven't, you're going places I haven't, where I haven't thought through these things. So that's, that's very helpful. Um, you know, it may be that the, uh, the good of, of you know, stars that are too distant for us to see, you know, it can't conflict with our goods. This is part of what I was, was trying to say to Chris. You know, there, there ought not be a nemesis star <laughs> or something like that that would, that would uh, frustrate and prevent um, the flourishing of, of organisms. But, it, but I'm not sure that, that they have to intelligibly contribute to the goods, the goods of, of organisms. There may be reasons to think that, that they must, but I, I, don't, I don't know them. Paul, let me, uh, Christian, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so Chris, Christian, and then we'll go to Max after that, okay? <clears throat> Thanks so much. Uh, so Paul, great paper, really rich, um, really intriguing. Lots of questions I have, if we have time to get to some of them, but I'll just start with this. Uh, so when I think about the, the ethical, I divide up into different categories. I think of the good, I think of the values, you know, goodness, badness. I also think of the obligatory, the ontological, um, ought, should, and then I also think about character and virtue. So you, the first half of your paper, you talked about the fact value gap, and you ended up making that into the is ought gap. Uh, it didn't come out as much in the presentation, but it's in the paper too, no right. more so. Um, but then it kind of, so now we're in the realm of obligation and duty. And then I didn't uh, play out much in the rest of the paper. So the first part of this question is, 
do you want to make the same claims about the obligatory as you do about the good? For example, do you want to make it primary? Uh, do you want to make it not dependent upon anything else? Um, so that's that's part one. Um, and if you're, some people say, don't ask part two, I need to answer part one. Um, but I, I can give you part two as, if you want it. Um, sure. part, the part two is, uh, could you say more about the relationship between both the obligatory and the good vis-a-vis -vis God? Um, so you didn't, I know it's not your project to talk about how the obligatory is related to God in this paper, but I just would invite you to share if you have some thoughts about that as, for example, is it the case that moral obligations dependent upon God's commands or God's will or something like that, or is it existing independently of God? But especially more relevant to the paper, how does the good hook up with God? Um, is God presumably perfectly good? And then when you talk about these things, the good, good things in creation, are they good in some derivative or dependent way? For example, the extent to which they resemble God's own goodness, to take an idea from Robert Adams. Um, if that's the case, then, then it, there's a sense of which the good isn't primitive or primary. It is still dependent or derivative. At least the good in the creation. Um, good things in creation are going to be derivative or uh, secondary in their in virtue of their relationship to what is ultimately good, namely God's goodness. Um, so to sum it up, uh, do you want to extend your comments to the uh, uh, deontological? And then secondly, how do you envision both parts of the uh, the moral uh, relating to God? Yeah, great question, uh, Christian. So. I'll take the second one first and then go back to the first. Um, and I may need you to drop my memory on the first, but I, hopefully I can hang on to it. So second question, there are kind of two parts. There's a question about how do I see the relationship between um, obligation, our obligation and God, and then how do I see our, the relationship between the good and God? And I hesitate to say much on this with you and Oliver <laughs> on the panel, uh, my, my, but there's there's some difficulties, um, not in principle, but just in terms of understanding the relationship. I think um, that that either of you two or the rest of the panel may be able to help clear up. But one is that um, yes, I mean it seems that the good does have to come from God. Traditional answers would say that the good of creation is. Um, from God, and we participate in God's goodness. So, um, you know, I'm, I don't think the tradition speaks uh, univocally on that point, monolithically, but that's a common answer. Uh, you brought up the point of, well, can, can good really be a building block if it's derivative on God's goodness? I think that it can. Um, there, there, I think, are good reasons for thinking that good is primitive, that it can't be reduced. Um, there have been no remotely plausible attempts to reduce it that I've ever seen. If you've seen one, please share. I, I would love to know about it. Um, so there, there, you know, these aren't the, the best kinds of arguments. Like, well, we tried a thousand times and failed. I don't, I don't love that kind of argument. But it's, it's sort of inductive reason to think that that the good is, is can't be analyzed, can't be broken out further. But I would say that. Uh, um, things can be primitive, they can be basic in this sort of building block sense without being simple. Um, and I think and my, my suspicion would be that's where we should go on this question. You know, how could it be that our that the goodness of creation is, de is um, derivative in some sense from God and it still be a basic building block? And so I, I would want to go that way. So here's a more um, kind of acceptable example, for at least for us philosophers, uh, basic uh, metaphysical modality, so possibility and necessity. So, you know, usually possibility is analyzed as um, something being not necessarily not the case, and necessity is analyzed as being not possibly not the case. So they're they're interdefined. So each of them, um, we can see from the analysis you know, that tells us what it, what it, what the thing is, what the phenomenon is. It has parts, it's complex, but it is not reducible. Uh, you're going to wind up with one of the other modal concepts, you know, any way you slice it. So these, these are examples of primitive features of the world, but which are nonetheless complex. And so I would, there's, there's a path, there's sort of an escape route for me there. And, and, and I, think this, I think something like this is true for goodness, even independent of the question about how it relates to God, uh, just because 
you know, philosophers like to break things apart and analyze. It's hard to do that with goodness. Um, goodness is present in all these different places. There is something that, you, but that must be the same and unite them or else you wouldn't be, you know, speaking in a unified way of them being good. At the same time, they are different. It's not, it does not seem that the goodness of um, a pumpkin seed sunfish is the same kind of goodness that there is in, uh, you know, think of cases of, of, of ethical action or, or even just in terms of comparing um, discernible value, you know, my daughter. You know, it, it's difficult, I think, to make a case that, you know, it's actually the same quality you're perceiving in each case. So I want to say um, goodness is a complex primitive. There's a component that unifies the goods, um, or else we'd be talking equivocally. Nonetheless, there is variation. Um, going, back, going back to, and so I, how does that work in the case of God? I do not know. I, I need to know more theology um, to, to, to even attempt an answer there, but, but um, in principle, maybe it can be done. Um, going back to your first question, I think was, what happened to the, what happened to the moral stuff, to the aughts? Um, in the second half of the paper. And what I want to say, the same sort of thing. Um, I, don't, I don't have well worked out views here. I mean, I, um, you know, which is, it's clear that, that the aughts are at least in some cases connected to the, to the goods. You know, sometimes, you know, plausibly you ought to save a drowning infant if you easily can. Um, at least in part because of the, the great value of, of the infant, the fact that it's a human being made in God's image. So, you know, there are cases where they're connected, but I don't have a worked out system that, that relates them. I mean, I, I would be inclined to a view at a very general level that something like God has um, uh, ordained or created us such that our, our, uh, our obligations on the earth to, to, of stewardship and of love, loving our neighbors, um, you know, non-accidentally correlate with some of the greatest goods, care of creation and, and love and care for other people. And so, um, you know, which is prior, did God give us the command because others are good or, or um, I, I think at least the good is there independent of, of any command God would give, um, but I'm not sure that, that the, the obligations can be reduced to the goods. Sorry, that's a lot of just, speculation, but that's tentatively how I see things. Uh, Max, go ahead. And then uh, after you, Max, I'd like to get in a couple uh, questions from the audience. Okay. Sure. Um, and I don't think my question is going to involve a, a detailed answer. Um, I was struck by how bold your claims were in the paper. Um, I'm just going to ask a question about one of them. Um, you said that if you want to know what something is, you have to find out what it is for. Uh, and since science can't really tell us about the telos or purpose of an organism, you make the bold claim that science cannot tell us what any created thing is. So my question is, is if um, science cannot tell us what any created thing is, can at least the biological sciences tell us what a created thing is not? So I, um, I appreciated your Zelda example that in a, in a video game, you can understand the working components, but it won't tell you a thing about the experiential event that the game is trying to produce for the gamer. So I really appreciated that example. Um, but I wanted to give off, uh, give a different example. Um, the example I'm thinking of is I, I work in the area of pleasure and I, and that engagement involves uh, reading a lot in the biological sciences. And I think it's a fair statement to say that um, from everything I've read, the unbridled pursuit of pleasure creates a lot of health problems in, in, for human beings, that, it's, uh, that we're not designed for unbridled pursuit of pleasure. Uh, we are designed for measured enjoyment of pleasure that enhances the quality of life, but not the unbridled pursuit. And so I think that the biological sciences do contribute to something I would call a, a via negativa, uh, what an organism is not for. And if it does that, then science, I think, addresses at least indirectly uh, the telos of organisms. And so that's the question that I had 
uh, in mind when, when I read your paper. So can we at least say that science can tell us what an organism is not for and indirectly therefore give us some insight into uh, what the purpose of organisms are? Yeah, that's interesting. So, uh, there is no way to empirically know the good for which an organism is intended, because there is no way, way to empirically know anything about goodness. I'm, I'm pretty confident of that. So, what's happening in the cases where uh, there are studies that show, well, you know. I'm less familiar with the cases you're talking about, but I can think of analogous cases, you know, cases that show, well, look what, look what smoking two packs a day for 10 years does to your lungs. Uh, this, is, this is not good for human beings. I think what's happening in those cases is uh, scientists are human beings, and so they are, they are good detectors. They don't have instruments that are unique to, to their discipline that, that give them any sort of advantage over anyone else. But they do have what everyone else has. And so there is, a, in some of the sciences, there is broader agreement on this or that good than in others. So in medicine, I would say it's a, a founding assumption of the entire enterprise that health is good. But there's nothing they can do in the lab that's going to tell, tell them or us or anyone else that that's the case. It's just um, human beings have enough of a, a recognition of this, of the goodness of health and that this is important for the flourishing and the thriving of human beings that we proceed on that assumption. But it's not something that, that the medical science can, sciences can tell us. They can tell us a great deal about what in particular um, helps human beings achieve this good end. And, and as you were describing, can prevent human beings from achieving this good end. But, um, uh, and that's very helpful. I, I don't wanna diminish um, the, the achievements of, of, of medical or, or psychological sciences or biological sciences in this regard. But again, it's not, um, it's not that they've been able to tell us anything new about what, the, what uh, the flourishing of human beings is or, or about, that, about that specific kind of goodness. Does that help answer your question or am I perhaps missing the thrust of it? I, uh... It, it, it does, it does address the question. It's just, I, I think that maybe you can, you know, bake your cake and eat it too, that we can talk about at least uh, via negativa that the sciences can tell us something about what we're not designed for. Um, and that closes off bad options for us. And in the remainder, there's a space where we can think, say theologically, uh, step outside the sciences. Uh, that that allows us to talk about tell us a purpose, and I don't want to say that the sciences are infallible in its data or claims. So th this assumes a critical engagement with the health sciences and challenging uh, uh, ideas or theories that are problematic. But given that we might find a theory or 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 a thesis that is actually really helpful and that we would say um, uh, seems to be you know, defend, defendable, then I would, I don't want to exclude that material when we talk about uh, what, at least what we're not for. Um, and then I think that gives us a little bit of more room uh, that complements your thesis uh, about the limits of what science can do. Paul, what if, That's if, all. We, if we're staying within sciences though, what about, um, you know, one of the audience uh, members had a question about what about studies within psychology? Can we, uh, if if um, if the good is related to um, what's specific for creatures and organisms, can't psychology tell us something about what's good in terms of well-being with respect to forgiveness or gratitude or good relationships, beauty, things along these lines? Uh, I think so. They can, but again. Um... The, uh, the work in of identifying what, what the, the good objective is doesn't come from the empirical study. It has to be assumed at the outset. So, you know, in studies of um, the, you know, the negative, like, like um, you know, Max was saying, there's studies that show if you just sort of hedonistically pursue, pursue pleasure, 
it takes a toll. And that's what I, what I, I took the outcome of those studies to be. Um, or, you know, mental health. Uh, these are, I, I take it, these are cases where we already have an implicit understanding of at least what we think the good is. And then we, then we arrange reality in controlled ways to see, to see how, how different, different circumstances um, affect or lead to or lead away from the things we've already taken for granted is the, is the desired outcome. Um, I mean, in the case of, I think about, uh, think about studies of, of, of mental stress or something like that. I mean, you might, you might say, look, the, the goal, um, you know, if you say, think about this activity, is activity X a good one for human beings to engage in? Well, as a result of our studies, it, it led to increased, you know, cortisol, you know, in the brain, it led to stress, um, then it had these apparently negative consequences. So it could, you, could, you can make those kinds of observations, but uh, it's not going to be sufficient to tell us um, whether the, the activity X is something that humans um, should or should not be doing, because it may be, I think about people who were, and this is kind of a, a cliched example, but I think it's, we hear them so much because they're, they're always so good. Um, think about someone who's rescuing people from a genocide. Um, they're, I'm sure they're experiencing a great deal of stress and that's taking a toll on them psychically. Uh, that's you know, insufficient to tell us that what they're doing is something they shouldn't be doing. Um, you might say, well, it still, it still tells us that they're, they're in a state where they're not thriving. You know, maybe that's because the, the overall state of the world is such that they can't. The studies still show, still show us that you can't thrive unless you, you know, have reduced cortisol or something like that. Uh, even then, you have, to, you have to have operating implicitly a conception of how things should be for an organism. And I just don't see how you, any principled way of getting that empirically. Um, you have to, you have to rely on some intuitive visceral sense. Um, you have to rely on something like um, consensus within your discipline, um, but you can't, you can't get it empirically. Uh, Paul, one more question uh, we have here from a biologist. Um, says he appreci appreciates your approach, but wants to know, given that disease, biological death, predation, and so forth existed before humans did, um, does this play any role in your approach? Um, I don't think so. So I take it that the question behind the question is something like, Paul, you uh, want us to look at um, discernibly good telosses for, for, cre for organisms as a way of understanding what they are. And part of the motivation or justification for that is knowing that they were created by a good creator. So how does that square with the fact that uh, you had, you know, presumably had animals tearing each other apart for, for millions of years um, before? Well, how was the question phrased? Was it before humans came along? I can't remember how it was put. Yes, uh, yeah. existed existed before humans did. Right. Um, I, I can't. Pardon me. Before the fall. Before the fall, actually, it was yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is a big question for all kinds of fields. You know, how do you account for how do you? The question is basically how do you square um, a, a contemporary, you know, old Earth conception of the development of biological life with uh, kind of traditional interpretations of scripture. And I, I don't feel that I have the expertise to, to, to deal with that question. Um, I will, I, what I can point out is that it, it's, it's not a decisive objection to my view. There are any number of ways of reconciling these two issues that, that um, permit us to continue to see that the, 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 you know, the kind of the, um, the purpose for which organisms were made must be a good one. One is just that we know that God is good and God is a creator. Um, that's, that's a very strong position from which to argue if you're operating within kind of the traditional monotheisms. Then it's, it's a further question, well, how do you, how do you make sense of it? And that, that's difficult, I think, um, but we have a strong starting place. Um, this is just pure autobiography, but I, lately I've been interested in what, what were known as uh, angelic fall hypotheses. That could be one, of, one way of dealing with the issue. Um, you know, when, when we read the biblical account of Adam and Eve in the garden, uh, 
um, uh, the serpent is already evil before the fall. So it seems that um, there was evil prior to the fall of humankind. And how far back does that go? We don't know. Uh, this, of course, takes a lot more spelling out. Um, various people are, are proposing hypotheses along these lines. But it's not the only way. But it is one way to, to account for how there could be um, deviation from from uh, from the you know the sort of frustration of, of achievement of these good of these good telosses even prior to the fall of humankind. Uh, there's more audience questions. Let me see if the panelists want to jump in at this point. Well, well, I would just say I, you're you're right, Paul. There are a number of ways of addressing that question about uh, the existence of predation. Uh, in the in the earth pre humanity and pre the fall, which to me seems to suggest that we cannot blame the existence of predation on the human fall. It, it, it's the, the two things are not necessarily related, I think, theologically um, or historically. Um, there seems to be no evidence in in the paleontological record or anywhere else that this earth has ever been any different from what we now see it to be in which death is essential to life in which all forms of life exist through to some degree the death of other forms of life and that includes ourselves uh, and all the life that lives on us um, uh, you know even down to the lowest level so the, the 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 fact that god says that when he saw what he had created he saw it and declared it to be good includes, I think, that reality, the, the, the goodness of creation is not incompatible with the, the way it exists. Uh, and so the, the assumption of some kind of moral evil in the sense that we normally think of evil uh, as also applying to the, uh, the animal kingdom in that way uh, is a, a difficult one. And, and I think Oliver may well want to discuss this too, but there, there's quite a lot of Christian, well, Christian scientists who are Christians, not Christian scientists, uh, who, who think this through and, 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 and say this, the, creation, the creation to be good wasn't a paradise in, in the sort of golden age kind of way. Uh, the, the one thing that, of course, is a little bit of a fly in the ointment of that is, of course, the eschatological vision of the new creation that we have in the, in the scriptures is one in which there will not be uh, predation or any form of death. And no, I think only God knows how that's going to happen. Um, but I, I think we can't retroactively attribute predation and other things that we don't like in the creation, like tectonic plate shifting and uh, hurricanes and tsunamis, all these things that are unpleasant in creation for us, um, as simply the way God made the world to be and it's not too easy to dictate and say, well, if I'd been God, I'd have done it better. But maybe Oliver's got a, another thought on that thorny one. I don't know. I would only want just to add that the whole question of predation, which of course includes such things as the predation of viruses on human organisms, um, which is very much to our mind, and in relation to which no one has dared to suggest that we should actually favor the successful reproduction of the virus that's causing us so much trouble. I don't know why no one has suggested it. Normally, everyone, everything is suggested by someone, but here is something <laughs> that seems to have escaped suggestion. Um, it does simply bring home to us that whatever illustrations of the good and, uh, and part insights into the good, our understanding of the condition of the flourishing of organisms may bring, the good is not the flourishing of any given organism. It cannot be. Uh, uh, it, it, it can, that is not compatible at any rate with the unitary good, which you, Paul, quite rightly insisted on. I would, but I would say that um, I, I, I think that's correct. It also doesn't, as far as I can tell, give us reason to think that the unitary good must include predation. Does that make sense? So, yes, you can't you can't say the good for the whole is, is the good for this one part. But on the other hand, I don't see that as a reason to think whatever the good for the whole winds up being is going to include the bad for some of some of the parts. 
it's simply, I think that the good and the bad has to be cached. Those terms have to be cached differently in relation to different aspects of creation. And I think you were saying yourself this, that the notion of the good can be basic or foundational without being simple. Um, I, I took that very point very strongly, I must say. And uh, it, it, it's certainly true that the good for the whole does not have to imply the bad for anything, but what is the bad for different kinds of thing will differ uh, as the kind of thing, so the difference of the good that goes with it, the, the bad that goes with it too. Paul. Yeah, go ahead, Paul, if you wanted to respond before I get to another question. Oh, we, yeah, just very briefly. I mean, that's, yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, that, one, of the, one of the, I think, um, issues lurking in the background here is when you think about organisms like viruses or mosquitoes or, or ticks, um, you know, parasites, uh, the question is, um, are these organisms who, whose flourishing uh, must ultimately also cohere with the whole as they currently appear to function? Or is, or is the right thing to say that these are organisms who are somehow defective in their essence. Um, you know, what, in other words, they they're not they're not beings whose whose existence can be attri attributed to a good creator. Uh, I don't have an answer to that question, but that's that's one of the issues that would I think have to be touched on to, to attempt to say, um, you know, where where the, where is the virus uh, at the restoration of all things? You know, where is the where is the hagfish? Where is the where is the flea? I don't have an answer. Paul, maybe we can end on this uh, last question from the audience, but presumably you've had plenty of, and it, th this may have a practical or even pastoral tint to it. Um, you, presumably you've had plenty of conversations with uh, people who are skeptical of rooting um, a, the good in a larger metaphysical framework. Um, uh, how, what, how, any strategies or tips that you have in terms of uh, trying to go about making your case that the good does need a broader framework and can't simply be derived from empirical science, science alone? That's a great question. Let me, let me think for one second. <clears throat> I mean, so the, in terms of a, a reason to think that you can't get good from empirical science itself, um, I, I like the case that uh, James Hunter and I make, make in our book. Um, I meant to actually say this in the talk, but I, I was trying to do it extemporaneously and sometimes there, there are casualties. One of the casualties was, uh, uh, it's less of an argument and more of a thought experiment, but I think one way to see um, the inability to, to find the good empirically comes from what we call the, the, these twin challenges. And so the, the twin challenges are um, to have a science of the good, an empirical science of the good, you have to do two things. You have to define the good uh, in such a way that it's empirically demonstrable, that you can detect it empirically. At the same time, you have to define the good in such a way that it's really about the good. You can't just say, oh, it's just about human pleasure or it's... Um, just about certain individuals getting what they want. That's the, those are unacceptable. You know, the, they're compatible with people doing great evil. The trouble is that if you, you any sort of de uh, definition of the good that you give that permits you to empirically observe it is of necessity going to leave out. Uh, it's going to exclude classic cases of ethical phenomenon phenomena. It's not going to permit you to talk about um, obligations or justice because these are these are fundamentally non-empirical things. And on the other hand, if you get a good definition of ethics that talks about you know, value or worthiness or obligation, um, because these are not empirically discern discernible, you're not going to be able to satisfy the sort of the demonstration, the empirical demonstration challenge. So that could help, you know, help someone at least see um, if there is good, you can't get it from empirical study, if that kind of thought experiment um, is helpful. It's a further question then, okay, but why should we think that anything is good? And, and here, the standard arguments against nihilism, I think are the best you can do. You know, almost, almost everyone who hasn't sort of made it one of their life goals to, to announce themselves as a moral nihilist 
there are some things they accept are, are good. You know, it, you know the, what, what, what these popular things are at different times may vary, but um, you, know, you could ask them, do you think the Black Lives Matter? I mean, most people are going to say yes, so you're not a moral nihilist. Uh, do, you, do you think that uh, it's okay to torture people for fun? Well, no. Um, you know, an entrenched nihilist will deny these things, and it's going to be hard to argue with that person. But for most folks, I think you can you can say some things to help them see the good is not empirical, and to, and to, and you at least get them to thoughtfully consider they probably already are committed to the reality of of the ethical. Um, how to get the big the broader metaphysical framework? That's tougher. <laughs> I mean, I think I think the place to begin. I know I'm going too long, I'll, I'll, I'll cut it off here, but the place to begin, I think, is, is thinking about um, what I was calling sort of the biological gr gratuitousness of certain organisms. And I think human beings are the best place to start. Um, our, our ability to, to experience and enjoy the beauty of the world uh, goes far beyond what's biologically necessary for our, for our survival and reproduction. Um, how could that be? What could account for that astonishing fact? Uh, it just seems like an amazing gift um, that we far too often do not notice. But reflection on that fact, I think could be helpful.